Today's Wednesday webinar is about digitizing your paper handouts more efficiently, and I'm excited to share with you all that Book Widgets has to offer. Just a quick reminder, if you're new to Book Widgets, Book Widgets is really four important components. A widget library of over 40 activity templates that you can use to create content, a complete integration with most learning management systems, including Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams, Schoology, Blackboard, and more. The ability to monitor student progress live, which as we know is so important to be able to provide students feedback on the challenges that they're facing and the successes that they have. And then finally, a reporting dashboard, which contains robust tools that you can use to review work in an efficient manner and return that work to your students with personalized feedback. Our agenda for today has four important points, importing and reusing questions, tips and tricks, and then an added bonus of using chat GPT for support on widgets and questions. Let's dive right in with the meat and potatoes of what we have to offer, which is importing questions from existing documents. Many of you have probably already created Word or PDF documents that you may have from a publisher, and you can easily add these questions into your existing or newly created book widgets activities. A couple of reminders, the two formats that are supported are DOCX and text-based PDF documents, not image-based PDF documents. So you may need to convert some of your documents. You will also need to select the correct answer for any of your questions that need an answer. And then finally, configure the rest of your widget. Let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at what we have here as we digitize our documents. I'm on my book widgets dashboard and I'm going to select a worksheet. Now, when we're importing our documents, most people will use the worksheet, the split worksheet, or the quiz, I'm going to go ahead and use the worksheet. And usually we come right here and add a question. But this time I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I'm going to come up to the cogwheel in the upper right. And I'm gonna go all the way down to the bottom to import from a document. The first document I'm going to grab is a Word document. And in my Word document, you can see that I have the questions from my worksheet. Don't worry that some of the formatting is gone. Book widgets will pick that right up for you. I'm going to start with my first question. What is the name of the country in red? Now I can, you see when I highlight it, get a list of pull down questions that are supported in the import. I'm going to use a single line text question, but I also have a picture. So I'm going to grab the picture and highlight question picture. I also, because this is a single line question, don't need to select a question. I'm going to go ahead and select import. And as soon as I get back into my editor, here is my question. I can go ahead and add a question mark if I like. Here I can put in a correct answer if I want to. So here I might want to have France. And remember, we can use those double hashtags if we would accept more than one answer. Of course, I'm ignoring the case, so I don't have to use the hashtag here. Let's take a look and see what that looks like in the preview. So here we have it. What is the name of the country in red? I have my single line text and my image was brought right in. Let's try another type of question. So back to our cogwheel, we're going to import from a document or PDF. I'm going to use a Word document again. And for my math and science teachers, I'm going to do a math e equation. So I have my simplify and my numbers. I'm going to select new question and pull down all the way from the bottom equations. And the great thing about this import is that it will pick up your symbols and use the latex formatting to make sure that everything is imported completely for you. This question has a three-step process, so I have my three steps here as my text. Once again, I'm going to select my import, and let's take a look at what that question looks like. I don't really want that number four in front of it, so I can remove my number four. I have my simplify, and if you don't know about the scratch pad and you teach math, science, even English language arts, under general, 
you can enable a scratch pad. A scratch pad is great when you want your students to show the work. You can configure it for each question or for every question. So I'm going to configure for each question. I'm going to use a no line scratch pad, but you also have horizontal lines and grid. Great for our math classes. I'm going to come back to my questions. Here's my question. Let's take a preview of what that importing looks like. Question number two with my simplify. And here's my scratch pad where my students can enter their work and I can see their thinking. For me, this is a really important part of when my students just, I want to know how did they arrive at the answer, not just did they get the right answer. And while I'm here, I don't know if anybody noticed this little star. This is also a new addition to book widgets. This star allows students to star a question that they may be thinking about or want to come back to so that they don't miss a question uh, or leave it out when they press the submit button. So that's an example of how we can import questions from a Word document. I want to show you something else. I'm going to come back up to my cog wheel, import from my Word document. Remember that map question that I had? I can do the same thing with a different type of question. So what is the name of the country in red? And let's say that I want to do a annotate picture kind of question. Let me grab my picture. This is my picture as well. Import. Now I have an extra step here and you'll see I had my red triangle. It's reminding me that I need to add my input field. I can click, bring my bullseye onto the red, and remember, you don't have to drag and drop the box. You can just click wherever you would like that box. Yep, I'm going to select done. Come back to my editor and enter my correct answer. Now I have that same question two, two different ways. I just wanted to show that to you. Now let's import from a PDF. So now I'm going to go get my PDF document. And once again, don't worry when you look at the formatting and it looks different, book widgets will pick that up for you. Let's highlight here. And if you don't get the full question, just click away. You can highlight. And if you have the wrong type of question as well, click your X, highlight again, and select your question. This time I'm going to do a multiple choice question and it's very important when you do the multiple choice question that you select all of the multiple choice options. So you see, I'm selecting them individually, one, two, three, and four. While I'm here on my PDF, let me go ahead and do a new question, fill in the blank. So I'm going to select a fill in the blank, new question. And this time I'm going to do a fill in the blank question. And this is such a time saver. All I have to do is highlight my paragraph. And Book Widgets is so smart, those little dash dashes or ellipses, Book Widgets will pick up as the double brackets and import that these are where you want your words to go. And before I can click back, here I have, what is the capital of Belgium? I'm going to make sure that I select the correct answer. And here's my fill in the blank. All I need to do now is put in my correct answers between my double brackets. So you can see how much time this will save you as you create content. And I want you to think about when might you do this? Maybe you're going to do a, a summative assessment. Uh, maybe you're going to do a review before a test. And so quickly and easily, you can set up a worksheet, worksheet importing uh, information from a Word or a PDF document. Now, of course, I want to remind you, you're not quite finished. You always want to make sure that you check out your correction and scoring options and any of your general options that you set up every time you do a book widgets activity. But that's how easy it is to import from a Word or PDF document. Now, we may also already have questions that we've created inside a widget. 
So you're not limited to just importing from a Word or a PDF document. You can create question banks and reuse content. I want to show you how I create question banks and reuse content. Here is my document that I created importing all of my five questions. I'm going to come right back up to my uh, cogwheel, but this time rather than selecting import from document, I'm going to select import from widget. That means that I have questions in an existing widget. And I just want to show you that I have in my PD samples, a test bank. So here I have my data bank, and this is questions that I want to use in other widgets. How do I uh, decide what questions I want to put in my data bank? I have a little trick. I put in questions that every one of my students got right, and I use my reporting dashboard to get that information. I put in questions that most of my students got wrong. So I have easy questions and difficult questions. And then I put in that mix of questions where students had them both correct and incorrect. So I'm gonna select import from widget. I'm going to come to wherever I have my test bank or my data bank. And then I can select every single question or I can select individual questions that I want. In this instance, I'm going to select every single question that I want for my final exam. And before I even got back here, all of my questions are here. And why I want to encourage you to create a data bank is if you're like me and you use recordings, you don't have to record again. If you're like me and you use images, you don't have to go find those images again. So you have everything here ready to go. So while all of your colleagues are running around, book widgets to the rescue, helping you create those assessments at the end of the year seamlessly and easily. But because you're here, I want to show you, did you know that you can import from flashcards? So this is a really great thing that I want to show you. So I'm choosing my widget to import from, and I'm gonna go get these flashcards. I'm gonna select all of my flashcards of my terms, and we have a, one more extra step. We're going to come here and import, and we have a choice. How do I want to import these questions? I love word and picture, so I'm going to do a word picture match, the front to the back, and import. And before I even get back, all of these blank spaces are really not blank spaces. All of these blank spaces are right here, my flashcards. And don't forget, if your students are on a small device, they can click on that image. Once they click on that image, they can use the plus and the minus to make it fit their screen. That's especially useful if your students are working from a smaller device or a cell phone. Everything is located right inside this activity. And just a reminder, you want to make sure that you go back to your dashboard and you make sure that you set up all of your general options. If you need a startup password, a calculator, a scratch pad, as well as your options for title and reporting, such as the submitting of answers and your correction and scoring options. So that's not imported from your previously made widgets. So you want to make sure that you always go back and you take a look at that. And we do have a link to a knowledge base article. So you don't have to remember everything off the top of your head. We will have a knowledge base article or a video to guide you through the process. Now let's talk about some tips and tricks to help you as you are working on your assessments or things you may not have noted or known about converting questions. I hope you pick up some really good tips here. My first is with true-false questions. Of course, we know that true-false questions are one of the most common type of questions that we have, and we're all familiar with true-false. But what about if we wanna shake up true-false? Have you ever thought about doing a highlight question? So in this instance, the students will read the word, and then they will highlight whether the uh, sentence or the statement is true or false. The students will have an option to 
think about the question and highlight, of course, we also have the clear. So that's a little bit of a different kind of activity from simple to more complex. But wait, we could do even more. How about creating drag and drop boxes where we would drag and drop information into the boxes? It's still true and false. It's just a different way of meeting the learning modalities and the needs of our students. And then to really go to the more complex type of true false question, here I've created a table. And if you don't work with tables inside book widgets, we're gonna do a lot of work today in tables. I encourage you to test them out. Uh, once you get the hang of tables, they are so much fun. So here in my first column, I'm going to enter whether or not my statement is true or false, but I've added an additional segment for my students. If the question is true, they don't need to do anything. But if the question is false, I'm asking them to give the rationale. So oftentimes I provide the rationale for my students. In this instance, my students are going to provide the rationale here for me. And when we really want to change up how our true false works, we can use a drop down menu. And I'll show you how to create these drop down menus if you're not sure on how to create those. And once again, our students will provide the rationale or the correction to complete that true false loop. This is a quiz. So my students will navigate all the way to the end of the quiz before they will uh, press submit but you can do the exact same thing in a worksheet. So let's go ahead and take a look at what a worksheet would look like. Your worksheet is just a scrolling piece of paper where your quiz has one question at a time. And so here we are again, my true false questions with the rationale. And this time, even if it's true, I'm asking my students to include the rationale as to why the question is true. So you're not limited to just a quiz. You can do a worksheet. You could even do a split worksheet if you wanted to. So just a way to change up your true-false questions. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I love to work with images. So I'm gonna spend some time with you on how to create diagrams, forms, and do some creative assignments. But don't worry, you'll notice that each one of these has a video to accompany it. So the first image picture that I would like to share with you is my popcorn. And in my popcorn picture, I've asked my students to write a word that pops into their head. I might use this as a brainstorming session before we start reading a story or writing. I might even use it as an exit ticket. And you'll notice that my students can type anywhere that they want to on this image. And I'm gonna show you how to set up this image so that your students can type on this image as well. I'm gonna come into my editor and I have saved my popcorn here. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up just so I show you a couple of things. Here's my question. And you see that I've added my input fields because this is an annotate picture question. I don't have anything here because I put it onto my background image. I want to scroll down first and I want to come here to field display options. I want you to make sure that you always check out these field display options. You notice on my popcorn, I didn't have a border. It's because I checked none here. If I checked solid line, let's just take a look at the preview. It's so distracting on my popcorn. So sometimes you don't want that solid line. So I'm going to do none. If you do have a border, you can choose the color and the marker. I'm not going to do that. And I also want to show you the background style. It can be solid, transparent, or semi-transparent. If I choose solid, once again, ugh, my students don't even see the popcorn. So I'm going to make that back background transparent. And it's as if it's magic that my students can type anywhere on the image that they want. I still have my input fields that I have marked. But, uh, I love using those options that we have. Scroll down below those input fields and look at your field display options. 
Of course, you also have the same options that you always have for your background picture. So you can choose an image that you have, import an image, or find that image online. And the background picture is where the students will place their work. So I just wanted to quickly show you how I created that popcorn image activity. I've done the same thing here with some tops and tips. So I've once again used a background image. I've hidden the borders, but my students will be able to type right in those boxes and submit their work. Here is a wonderful activity for the opening of school. If you're always searching for something for the opening of school, I always have trouble remembering my students' names. So I ask them to take a picture and record how to say their name so that on the first day of school, I'm recording the, or I'm saying their name correctly and some general information. Once again, I've hidden those borders like I showed you with my popcorn and my student can type right here exactly the information that they're looking for. The same with the likes. I like whatever it is, and they can continue to fill out this imaginary Facebook post with information about you. And I love uh, ending, my, my colleague Kate tells me a lot about SEL, and I love ending with always asking my students, well, how are you feeling today? And I say to them, don't worry, I won't share this with anyone. So if you're a little bit scared or feeling lost, it's okay to let me know. So I love this kind of activity that you can use to really use those annotate picture options. Let's talk a little bit about forms and diagrams. Here, I have a hierarchy of a business model. My, maybe I might use this for a psychology or a sociology class. And you'll notice that I have each of the uh, layers here of Maslow's hierarchy, and I'm gonna ask my students to fill in what that hierarchy is. Here I have a science activity and another science activity. Pay special attention to this one. I'm gonna show you an awesome trick. And then for financial literacy, I have an activity where my students will learn how to enter credit card information into a form, what a CVV is, a billing address, all of those things that we want our students to know in financial literacy. And then of course, because this is a quiz, my submit button. But I want to show you something with these forms and diagrams. I'm gonna show you some really great tips and tricks. I already showed you the popcorn field, but I want to show you how we set up these fields. Here is my image, and I'm going to set up my input fields. And you'll notice I dragged that input field to totally cover the box. So I resize that input field so that anywhere my students type, their answer will have that input. Also, don't forget to go below your input fields to see your field display options. Once again, I don't have a border, and this time I had a solid background. I want to show you this question, because when you look at this question, you're going to be amazed. In this question, when I move this away, the answer is already there. How many times have you spent hours trying to cover up Photoshop, Google Slides? We don't have to anymore. All you have to do is use those options inside the annotate image to help you cover up the words that are there. So let me remind you again, what I did is from my main question page for the question, I scrolled down to my field display options. And this time I did a solid line because what would happen if I made it transparent? Everybody would see the answer and that's not what I want. So I'm going to make sure that I have a solid line here. And now when my students see their work, everything is covered up. And I'm just going to give you a little hint this image right here of the heart, I'm going to tell you every one of these spots has the word already there. Let's take a look at the heart so you can see this as well. Here's my image of the heart. And if I move this out of the way, there are the correct answers. Now, of course, your students can't move these fields out of the way. You position these fields so you don't have to worry at all about that. 
Now, I didn't talk about this option up here, the enable and disable marker. I really wanna highlight this for you. Right now, I don't have the marker enabled. And when I don't have the marker enabled, I just have my input boxes. And on this image, I have a lot of input boxes. I want to show you what happens when I enable the marker. I click done. And now I feel as if my image is just too cluttered up. So I'm not going to enable all of the lines and everything for the marker. I'm going to keep my marker disabled. Once again, these options are all up to you. How you cover the field, how you enable the marker, everything is up to you so that you can make the activities exactly the way that you want them to be for your students at the end of the year. So don't forget that cover field, you can expand, you can make it transparent, or you can make it solid so that your students can't see those answers. If you teach young ones, elementary school, pre-K or K, we know that sometimes those fine motor skills are tricky for students. So if you look here, I have enabled in my drag and drop that my students can sort of get anywhere close to where they want to drag and drop these emojis. So they don't have to really concentrate on those fine motor skills. I'll make sure that I highlight where we drop in the boxes or we allow the students to drag or drop outside of those boxes. Another really great way that we can test our students is with a diagram for science, English language arts, social studies, even physical education. In this instance, I've tell, told my students that I have these definitions, these words, and I want them to type them into the box. So my students will come up to the box and type the word, but I can change up this activity as well. And I can do a drag and drop type question. So I still have my fish, I still have my words. And in this instance, my students, especially if I have students who are challenged with typing, this drag and drop is a great activity that you can use with your students as well. And because this is a quiz, they will navigate to that last page and press the submit button. Don't forget, you have that knowledge base article and the videos there as well to guide you along. Now, have you ever tried to use images and when you use them, they're all different sizes? So there's no problem with book widgets. You'll see here that all of my images are the same size and I can drag them into boxes that are the exact same size. I'm gonna show you how to do that with our book widgets editor. So I'm going to come to my phases of the moon, which is the activity that I had here in my moon cycle. I've already imported my question and this is a drag and drop question. So I have my images here. We can come here to our, our background image and we can change the width of our background image if we want to, but I'm not very concerned about my background image. I just wanna make sure that all of my other images are going to fit exactly for me and appear in the exact same way. So once again, we're gonna scroll further down and we're going to make sure that we come to our background. And in our background, we have choices, no resize or shrink to fit. So you can play with your background to see how you want it. And then super important, our Dropbox options. And right here, I'm saying, let me tell you where the Dropbox are. Otherwise, when Book Widgets creates it, Book Widgets will create the Dropboxes. I have specific places for the phases of the moon. So I'm going to specify the drop boxes. You can also specify the border in the background. And here's what I was showing you. On the emoji worksheet, I unchecked this box so that students with little fingers or lack of fine motor skills could drop anywhere. But for this activity, I only want my students to be able to drop into that white box. And then remember how I had them all sized the same way? Here it is image resizing. I can choose none or fixed. I'm going to choose fixed. And once again, I played around in the creation stage until I got the size that I felt was perfect for me. So this will give you the height to which your images are resized. So now 
all of my images look exactly the same. We also have this show header and hide header box. When you tick this, the image group will appear as a header. We don't really want that because now our students have all the answers. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to take that header off so that my students don't have the header and they're able to drag and drop their work here. So I hope you picked up on all of those different resizing and drop options because they will really help you as you create content. Let's go on now to crossword puzzles. I love crossword puzzles. And of course, we know that when we make a crossword puzzle, we have our words. But have you ever thought about making a crossword puzzle a different way with images? So here's a crossword puzzle that I used images for. And here you can see one across tells me to look at image one. So I look at image one and I know that this is a butterfly. So I will be able to import the words, input the words according to the image rather than the word. I teach world languages, French and Latin. So I love using images uh, for my students rather than just words. So this is just a different way that you can insert images into a crossword puzzle. So let me go ahead and show you how we can do this. I'm going to come to my widgets, my PD sample, and I'm going to open up that crossword puzzle. Of course, this is my crossword that I make with my clues and my answers. But here I want to show you how you can insert the images. So the first thing I've done is switched to a rich text editor, and then I've inserted a table. Remember how I told you, I really encourage you to try tables. When you insert the table, you can choose the number of rows and the number of columns that you would like to insert or submit. And then you could say, find the correct animal according to the image. So here I am. You can see that I can add or delete anything that I want to. I'm going to come back up to my rich text editor, find an image online. I'm going to look for a hippo. That's a great picture of my hippo. Oh my gosh, see how big he is? I can come right here, adjust. And I can make all of my images have the exact same size with that quick adjustment on my cogwheel. And then I'm going to make sure that I come down here, I add my word, hippo, and it is image G. Generate my puzzle because I added something new. And now, there's my hippo. Ah, I know that I need to adjust that image size a little bit and away I go. So if you have not started using tables yet, I would encourage you to use tables. They're really a great way to change up the teaching and learning for your students. So those are crossword puzzle options. Now let's talk about when we want to do some matching. A lot of teachers love to use matching, but sometimes we see questions about, I have more than two items. So I want to do more than an audio word, audio picture, word to word match. Well, Book Widgets has the power of yes to have a solution for you. And the solution is to make a group items question. When you make a group items question, your students will, according to your direction, grab the items, drag and drop them together and group them. And book widgets, of course, will do the grading for you. And so you will be able to group items like we have in math. What about here for science? I have text, I have image, I have a recording, and I have a picture. So this is really looking at some synthesis and higher order thinking skills. So this animal has a black mask, I know is my raccoon. Now I'm gonna go and look for my raccoon word, drag and drop it into here, find the correct uh, audio file and match everything up. 
And once again, don't forget to amp up your correction because you're asking your students to do a lot on these drag and drop activities. Here is another great world language activity where I'm asking my students to find the French, find the English, and find the correct pronunciation. So group items is really a great way that you can synthesize your learning for your students. And remember, all of these activities you will find with the make a copy in my account so that you can play around with them as well as you think about your end of year assessments. So let's talk about fill in the blank questions. Fill in the blank questions, of course, you can have multiple answers using that double hashtag that we've talked about before. But have you ever used a drop down list for fill in the blank? Or have you ever changed the input field size in fill in the blank? Why would you want to change the input field size? Well, for me, I like the input field size exactly the same. So my students aren't like, oh, that must be a short answer or that must be a long answer. So here's our typical fill in the blank where our student has to have that knowledge and know exactly what word goes into the box but we could do something different. And once again, I have a table here for you where I have the image and the student will enter what they believe that image is. But there's even more that you can do with fill in the blank. As I said, you can do a drop down with corrections. And I want you to pay attention to question number five. Look at the input field, how it drops off my screen. I'm gonna show you something really cool that you can do in just a minute. And then, of course, because it's a quiz, we always have our show answers. So I want to hop back out to my editor. So I'm going back into my book widgets editor. And you can use your editor directly inside your LMS or via the website like I'm doing here. I'm going to check my fill in the blank table. And here's my first paragraph that I had with my double brackets showing my correct answers. Here is my rich text question with a table. So one cell of the table was the image. The second cell of the table is the input field. And here is a great example of how you can use the double hashtags for correct answers. I know that most of my students will say panda, but some of my students might say giant panda, panda bear, a panda. So you can use that double hashtag. And why do I want you to encourage to think of the answers that would be correct that your students might write? Because when Book Widgets does the grading for you, it makes it so much easier. Don't forget, you always want to check out those scoring options as you're working through setting up your fill in the blank questions or any style of question. So here is my fill in the blank with the drop down menu. And the way that I get my drop down menu is with the double brackets. Between the double brackets, I put the word select. With after the word select, I always put the correct answer first, then my double hashtag and any other distractors. And it doesn't have to be just two words. You can add as many words from the drop down list as you want. And this is one of the reasons why I'm really talking to you about importing questions from other widgets. It takes time to do all of this, but if you've done it once, you can import that question and reuse it again. Don't forget that you have directions here where it says learn more. Here you also have directions on helping you. So if you're new to book widgets, always check out what's in gray or the learn more. You'll notice here I included a rationale, as well as don't forget your correction and scoring options. Now, remember how I told you sentence number five, the correction went off of my border? I'm gonna come right here. So you'll notice once again, here is how I get that input field. And if I want all of my input fields exactly the same, I just make sure that this number is exactly the same. So I'm gonna change my number to 795 so that all of my input fields are the same length. So no additional hints for my students. And when I come to those input fields, now they're all nice and tidy and lined up. 
I love this hint, so I hope that you find it helpful as well. So we went over adding multiple answers, the drop-down list with the double brackets, always put the correct answer first, your expand field again with the double brackets, and then of course, the fill-in table with the images, which I think will be really great for science, math, social studies. Continuing on, the text question, which is an ungraded question, is really a great option for you to use in so many different ways. For example, you can use text questions to create sections in a assignment, especially if you want to chunk material. I'm gonna show you four quick ways that we can use a text question. Here's an example of a text question. PXL Business wants their header on every activity that participants do. So they've inserted a text question here uh, that is just their header. Other activities that we can do is, for example, instructions. Here is a video quiz with all of the instructions right there for the students before they continue to the video. So this is where I have embedded a text question to chunk the material for each one of my sections that my students are reading about. And as I said, I was even able to embed a 3D image of my bee here for my students to investigate and look around. So book widgets is really only limited by your imagination. And then of course, at the end of the year, maybe you want to add some pizzazz to the end, the last question before your students submit. So something fun just to give them a little bit of encouragement as they leave you at the end of the year. You can add an image, a GIF, a video, even an audio recording. So you have all sorts of things right before the students hit that submit button that they can uh, listen to your voice one last time or hear something from you before they go. Now, I'm not showing every example that we have here because we are limited to just our webinar time. So remember, I was talking to you about tables. Tables are super easy to create once you get the hang of creating tables. And here is a table that I use for English language arts. I give my students words, I ask them to make a sentence, and then they will type the sentence into another cell of the table. Of course, who doesn't love a Sudoku? And once again, my students will be able to input the numbers into these cells as they solve the Sudoku or something simple like completing a math problem. And you'll notice once again, I included the uh, scratch pad on this math problem. This math problem happens to have grid paper. Remember that you can choose the grid or a plain paper or uh, nothing at all. So we have uh, this activity for you. Uh, I want to go ahead and show you in the editor how you can also um, set this up. Let's go ahead and take a look here on your toolbar in the editor you're always going to want to make sure you use that shift and click so that you can select the cells and you also have the option to make the cells larger by selecting the entire table i want to finish up with rubrics and whiteboards rubrics are something that i think will be really great for you at the end of the year of course you have your bonus a video part one and part two and we have five different examples of rubrics. The rubric that I would like to show you is the self-assessment or reflection rubric that is right here. And this self-assessment or reflection rubric, the student is able to really think about their work and what they've done. You might do, be doing a project at the end of the year and want to have a rubric where your students really think about what it is that they're, they're doing and you want to see what they think about their learning as well then as what you want to tell them about their learning. The great thing about a rubric is that the students fill it in and then also you can fill in a rubric. Here is my book widgets account. And this time I'm going to go to my grades and reporting. So I'm gonna hop on down to my grades and reporting. And I just want to show you an example of a rubric. 
I'm not inside an LMS right now, so I'm not using a class. And I'm going to go to where my student submitted a rubric. Here is my developmental rubric. And the reason that I wanna show it to you is it's very specific. When the student answers, this is what I wanted to show you. You will get the little graduation hat, which tells you that this is how the student rated themselves. And then when I rate the student, it's in this dark blue. So you can have both you and the student with the exact same rating or you and the student with a different rating. And of course you return this work to that student just like you normally would anytime you are returning work. So I just really wanted to highlight that for you because I think it's a great way for you to see how your students are um, being able to turn in work, especially through a rubric. All right, I'm gonna hop back into our uh, slide deck and I'm going to show you uh, just real quickly a whiteboard. All right, really quickly, I wanna show you the whiteboard widget because a whiteboard is also a great activity that you can use in um, your teaching and learning. And in a whiteboard, you can add a background image. Whiteboards can be a simple whiteboard or a split whiteboard. And I have examples here, as well as a how-to video. I'm just gonna show you this example with a background image. It's like my popcorn. But in this instance, my students are gonna be doing some math. And in the math, they're going to grab their coloring tool and wherever they think that correct answer is, they're going to select that correct answer. Additionally, I can let students add images. And right here, you see the difference is I've added the photo tool in that whiteboard image. And I can also allow my students to work with stickers. So you see now at the bottom, I have a star and I've added some stickers that my students can use. The great thing about stickers is that once you have them, you can make them bigger or smaller. You can turn the sticker any way you'd like it. And once you have it perfectly the way you want it, you just click the check mark and you're good to go. And then finally, we can place a background image on top. Why would I wanna place a background image on top? I'm gonna to show you, I'm gonna change my color here. And you see, there's no drawing except when I'm on the image. So if I want to contain the space where I want my students to put their information, I can put that background image on top. So some really great things that you can do with whiteboards, but I'm sure you're all excited about chat GPT and chat GPT can really save you time as you create with book widgets. So a couple of things, uh, chat GPT is free, so you can get a free account. You don't have to get the paid for version unless you want to. And a super, super big tip, use that control or command P so that you can copy or print uh, and then import like I showed you at the beginning of our session. These are some examples that our team has created from ChatGPT. This is what we said, generate instructions for this text question. I have an ESL course two, these levels, this is what I want. I'd like you to write the directions. And in less than two minutes, here's what I got. Now all you have to do is save as a PDF or a Word document and away you go. Here I ask to generate a rubric. Don't let rubrics scare you. We can generate the rubric in ChatGPT. Look at what we have. Everything ready for you. Create true false questions. And noticed I use the formatting that book widgets use, the double hashtag true, the double hashtag false. And this time I asked for the explanation, amping up that true false. So now I have my correct answers ready to import directly into book widgets. Here, we're gonna do a fill in the blank and drag words in a sentence. And we've reminded ChatGPT that we use those double brackets. You can also give an existing text to ChatGPT and ask them to put certain words into brackets. So if you have existing documents from a vendor or something that you've made earlier in the year, you can generate things quickly and easily. Because sometimes for me, the creation part is what takes time. So let ChatGPT help you along with book widgets.
Here's another fill in the blank and drag words. Here's what we get. A multiple choice quiz. Notice I told ChatGPT GPT to tell me the correct answers. You have to be smart when you craft your questions for ChatGPT. Here are my questions with the multiple choice as well as the correct answer. I can do matching questions, matching rooms, words, English to Dutch, Dutch to English, French to Dutch, fill in the blank. There again, a question table. You don't have to do all the work. Chat GPT can do the work for you. So when we talk about working smarter, not harder, use the tools that are available to you. Use the technology that's available to you. Here's putting uh, paragraphs in order to make a complete story. And then finally, marking a sentence. And you'll notice I told ChatGPT how many words I would like. I told them about the formatting, gave them an example of the formatting, and this is what I got. I'm so excited to share with you what you can do with ChatGPT, but also what you can do with the existing questions you have, the existing documents that you have, and the existing PDF files that you have. I know that we had a lot that we put together in this webinar, so we always have resources available to you. Of course, if you have an idea for something that you would like to see in Book Widgets, I would encourage you to write feedback to support at bookwidgets.com. When our engineers hear feedback from users, they really do listen. That's how we always are having updates. So any feedback you have, please send that to support at bookwidgets.com. Of course, you know about our webinars, you're here. We also have our tutorials and knowledge base, which I've included in the slide deck, which I will be sharing with you. If you're not a member of our Facebook community, or you don't read our blog, or you're not a member of our blog group in Book Widgets, I would encourage you to join those groups as well. And if you get stuck or you can't find something, you can always reach out to Kate and me. I want to thank everybody today for joining us in this Book Widgets webinar.